The Academy has just concluded its meeting, and we are ready to announce this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. And as usual, we'll go between the languages. I am Joran Hansen, I'm the Secretary General of the Academy, and with me here at the podium is on my right, Professor Nils Mortensen, the Chairman of the Nobel Committee for Physics, and on my left, Professor Olga Botner, who is a member of the Nobel Committee and an expert in the area of this year's prize. And later on, we hope to have one of our new Nobel laureates with us on the phone line. This year's prize is about a discovery that shook the world. Årets pris handlar om en upptäckt som skakade världen. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att utdela 2017 års Nobelpris i fysik med ena hälften till Rainer Weiss och med andra hälften gemensamt till Barry C. Barish och Kip S. Thorne, samtliga medlemmar i LIGO Virgo kollaborationen. Och akademins motivering lyder för avgörande bidrag till LIGO-detektorn och observationen av gravitationsvågor. Och här får ni ut pressmaterialet. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics with one half to Rainer Weiss and the other half jointly to Barry C. Barish and Kip S. Thorne, all of them members of the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. And the Academy citation runs for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. Für entscheidende Beiträge zum LIGO Detektor und die Beobachtung von Gravitationswellen, pour die Contribution décisive au Detektor LIGO et aux observations des ondes gravitationnelles. Zarechayoshi vklad v LIGO Detektor i zanabliudenje gravitationich vol. And here, as you see, we have our new Nobel laureates with us on the screen above me. Uh, a li little bit of information about them. Rainer Weiss was born in 1932 in Berlin, in Germany. He received his PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States, and he is still affiliated with the MIT as professor of physics. Dr. Weiss is, since many years, a US citizen. Barry Barish was born in 1936 in Nebraska, in the United States. He's a professor of physics at Caltech, the California Institute of Technology. And finally, Kip Thorne was born in 1940 in Utah, in the US. And he's currently professor of theoretical physics at Caltech. And as I mentioned, all three Nobel laureates are members of the LIGO-Virgo collaboration a large team of more than a thousand scientists who built and ran the detector that was used to discover gravitational waves. And with that, I'll give the word to the chairman of the Nobel Committee, Nils Mortensen, who will give us a brief summary of the research field and the discovery that has been awarded today. Nils. Yeah. Yeah. On the 14th of September 2015, for 15, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, succeeded for the first time to directly observe gravitational waves. These waves were predicted by Einstein 100 years ago, but until now they have escaped direct detection. This is a truly remarkable achievement, which crowns almost 50 years of experimental efforts by hundreds of scientists and engineers. And today, the LIGO collaboration includes a thousand members from 90 institutions in five continents who have directly or indirectly contributed to this breakthrough. This year's Nobel laureates represent in an excellent way the diverse competencies needed for LIGO success. Rainer Weiss led the foundation for the detector design. 
He analyzed what performances had to be reached for the critical parts of the instrument and what sources of background noise had to be mastered. And Kip Thorne, also a co-founder of LIGO, made predictions about what signals were expected from different astrophysical events of critical importance for the design. Uh, Barry Barish is a scientific leader who scaled the project up in a stepwise fashion up to the advanced LIGO, thereby reaching the sensitivity which will in the end allow the successful detection. Without them, disco the discovery would not have happened. We now witness the dawn of a new field, gravitational wave astronomy. This will teach us about the most violent processes in the universe and it will lead to new insights into the nature of extreme gravity. Thank you, Nils. And now, Olga Botner will give us some more insights into the discovery, the scientists and the collaboration. Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'll try not to stand in the way of anyone. Once upon a time, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, two massive black holes engaged in a deadly dance. Revolving around each other, spiraling faster and faster, whirling finally at half the velocity of light, they collided and merged, forming an even more massive black hole. This momentous event reverberated through space and time as gravitational waves sped outwards, carrying information on what had just happened. These events took place about 1.3 billion years ago, at a time when the first multicellular life emerged on Earth. Ever since then have the gravitational waves sped through the universe, reaching our cosmic neighborhood, the Magellanic Clouds, about 200,000 years ago, when early Homo sapiens walked in Africa and finally swept through the Earth on September 14, 2015, when the waves were recorded by perhaps the most sensitive instrument ever devised by man, the LIGO Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory at 9.50.45 UTC. This event caused a sensation worldwide. We knew that gravitational waves existed indirectly, but this was the first time ever they had been directly observed. And this, of course, made the headlines of major newspapers like the New York Times. So what are the gravitational waves? Well, they were predicted by Einstein within his general theory of relativity. Gravitational waves arise when heavy bodies accelerate, that is, when their velocity is changing with time. They are disturbances of space-time traveling through the universe at the speed of light, causing space to alternately stretch and shrink at right angles to the direction of motion. Now, the effect, the gravitational strain, is tiny, even from a ponderous event like the collision and merger of two black holes. If we imagine a ruler, the length of the Earth's diameter, like 13,000 kilometers, a passing gravitational wave would make this ruler vibrate by one trillionth of a millimeter, which is about the size of an atomic nucleus. Nevertheless, the team of scientists led by this year's Nobel laureate, succeeded in measuring this tiny vibrance. The key to this success is laser interferometry. And I'm now trying to explain the principle behind laser interferometry for you. The light from a laser is led towards a beam splitter, where the light is split along two detector arms, 
at right angle to each other. In the case of LIGA, these detector arms are four kilometers long. Mirrors at the end of the arms reflect the light back towards the beam splitter, where the two waves are overlaid and channeled towards the light detector, where fringe pattern is registered. Now, a passing gravitational wave will make one of the arms shrink when the other arm expands. And this makes the pattern shift very, very slightly. And this is what the scientists detect. Now, the effect is incredibly small. And the detector is amazingly sensitive. A passing truck or ocean waves beating against the far shore cause a disturbance, which must be monitored and offset. Also, to exclude local disturbances, each LIGO detector cannot operate on its own. And this is why the LIGO Observatory comprises two detectors, one in Hanford in Washington State and the other in Livingston, Louisiana. On opposite coasts of the American continent, separated by about 3,000 kilometers. And on the left hand, you see panels showing you the gravitational wave registered on September 14, 2015 by the two detectors. The upper panel shows the wave registered at Hanford, the middle panel at Livingston, and the bottom panel shows the two waveforms overlaid shifted by the time difference between the gravitational wave's arrival at the two sides, which was 6.9 milliseconds. And what I would like you to note in the bottom panel is how identical the two waveforms are. And this is essential to be able to recognize this event as a true occurrence and not a false signal. Now, looking at this lower hand, uh, at the left hand panel, I would like you to know something else, namely that the waveforms wiggle faster and faster as time progresses to reach a climax at about 0.4 seconds. This is the point when the black holes merge and then to quiet down. Now, this increase in frequency with time can be represented in terms of an audible signal. And I'm going to play for you this audible signal, the, the now so famous chirp of the gravitational wave. But to do that, you have to be very quiet and listen for a faint twang, which is when the two black holes merge. I'm going to play this four times. So here goes. And this brings me to my last slide. The discovery, the first ever observation of a gravitational wave was a milestone opening a new window to the universe. The prospects of observing black holes hands-on are tremendously exciting, as are the prospects of being able to see the dark parts of the universe, the parts of the universe from which electromagnetic radiation, light, does not reach us. Since the first observation, three more discoveries of gravitational waves passing the Earth have been made. The last one announced less than a week ago where the twin LIGO detectors operated in concert with their sister detector Virgo in Italy. This is truly the dawn of gravitational wave astronomy. And I couldn't help but end with Einstein, who obviously was right again, even though back when, for a while, he didn't believe that gravitational waves existed. And so I'm going to leave you with a picture of the three Nobel laureates, the leaders of the international team of scientists behind the discovery that shook the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga.
for that exciting introduction to the field. Uh, and we may now have one of our Nobel laureates with us on a phone line uh, from the US. Dr. Weiss, are you there? Oh, I'm here, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Good morning. This is Joran Hansen, the guy who woke you up uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. an hour ago or so. How are you now? I'm fine. I even have clothing on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> it's just a phone line, so, so it's not uh, absolutely That's mandatory, fine, yeah. but you, you don't have to freeze then. So I'm now sitting in the beautiful session hall of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. We're in the midst of the press conference. Here are journalists from Swedish and international media, and I'm sure they would like to ask you some questions. So are you ready for them, Dr. Weiss? I hope I am. I hope I can understand. Yeah. yeah. Please, Thomas von Heine. Good, uh, good morning, Professor. Congratulations, Swedish television. Von Heine is my name. Um, I'm, I'm curious, we just heard that now by uh, sort of seeing these uh, gravitational waves you can uh, d uh, deduce what happened when two black holes merged and what else is there that we can learn now that we can detect them? Well, there's a huge amount of things to find out in the universe that radiate gravitational waves. I mean, the black holes are the, probably the strongest source, but there are many, many others. And uh, for example, um, the, uh, the neutron stars themselves, which are now stars that are not yet black holes, they are still stars that are quite finite in size. Uh, and they get together, in fact, the very first discovery that was made of gravitational waves, indirect discovery, but a very important one, was done with a pair of neutron stars. There was a Nobel Prize given for that back in the 90s, uh, where they were observed, neutron stars, they're in a pair, kept going around each other. And through the motions you could determine, the motions of the two stars, you could determine that they were radiating gravitational waves. It was a major discovery in, in the field of gravitation. Uh, the other kinds of things that, that was a, we hope to see those, we hope the, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, uh, supernova at one point. It's not so easy. There are not so many of them, but these are stars that have come to the end of their lives, and uh, they then rapidly collapse, and in the process of collapsing, if they have any kind of a spherical motion, motion that is completely spherical, which most likely will be the case, they will also radiate. And in fact, they will radiate and tell us really what goes on in the supernova, which would be out of the uh, the, uh, the And there is uh, in the future also the business, eventually, the idea of looking for a background radiation of gravitational waves, which is a, uh, just a noise that comes from the whole universe in a way because you haven't quite resolved all the sources. But there will be a background noise of gravitational waves that. So there, there is now a way of looking, technique that was developed, of looking at the, a part of the universe that never really seen before. A lot of things that do not send their messages out electromagnetically. They send them out by making gravitational waves. So uh, we're very hopeful that it uh, becomes really part of astronomy and astrophysics, not just the uniqueness of having made a detection of sync gravitational waves. For a few of them. this become part of the science of understanding the universe. Okay, thank you very much. There's a sli slight problem with the phone line, but I think you could hear. We have a question over there. Yeah. Uh, uh, congratulations, Professor Weiss. Uh, I'm Sufficient Axasong, freelance reporter for China Radio and also reporter for Green Post. Uh, my question is. Uh, did you expect this, or did you know that you have been nominated? And uh, what, uh, what was your reaction when you heard the news? Thank you. Hi. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. I mean, I, but I, I view this more as a, a thing that it recognizes the work of about a thousand people. And uh, it's the work of really a dedicated effort 
that has been going on for, I hate to tell you, it's as long as 40 years of people thinking about this, trying to make a detection of sometimes failing in the early days, and then slowly but surely getting the technology together to be able to do it. And uh, it's very, very exciting that it, it worked out in the end that we are actually detecting things and actually adding to the knowledge through gravitational waves of what goes on in the universe. It's a wonderful experience, sort of begun a new f And I, many of us who are in this thing fully expect that we're going to learn things that we didn't know about. I mean, at this moment, we do know about, we knew about black holes other ways, and we knew about neutron stars. We've known about, uh, well, those are the two things that uh, ultimately are seen. But the thing is that uh, we hope that there are all sorts of phenomena that you can see mostly because of the gravitational waves they emit. That will open a new science and will add to the science that is already, you know, such a deep thing in terms of understanding the universe. So uh, I can't answer you any better than that. I think that was a great answer. Thank you very much. More questions? The lady over there. Hi, I'm Annelie Megner Arn, and I'm from the Swedish TV4. Congratulations. This was a really cool discovery. Uh, I wonder when uh, I no, no when um, Röntgen got the first Nobel Prize in physics when he discovered the X-ray, I don't think he thought that in a hundred or a little bit more uh, time we would be using these X-ray waves in hospitals daily and dentists and so on. And I wonder, in a hundred years from now, do you think we will have little small devices and measure those gravitational waves? What, what if you can speculate in a hundred years, what do you think your discovery will be used for? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought much about it. Uh, the, when we think about the future for this field, we think of improving sensitivity uh, so that we can look deeper and deeper into the universe. And in particular, uh, we hope at, at some point, but not the detectors we have now, because they're not, they're not strong enough, they're not sensitive enough, we hope to be able to look at the beginnings of the universe. For example, uh, we hope at some point to have detectors that are sensitive enough so that you can spot black holes over the entire universe so that you can see the evolution of that particular kind of source. And uh, as time goes on, uh, we hope the detectors get more and more sensitive. But I don't think they'll get necessarily small. Uh, that's my guess. They will probably get more and more sensitive if we do our job properly. People who follow us. Uh, learn how to make the detector better. There is as easily another factor behind it in the sensitivity of these detectors. And in the process, one would imagine that you begin things like the very, the very earliest moment in the universe. It's one of the ideas that thought about a lot. But detectors are not sensitive enough to see that. For example, there, there are calculations that have been done uh, that indicate that the very earliest in the universe, right after the universe gets born, there is an enormous amount of background radiation of gravitational waves generated. And that would be absolutely fascinating to see. Now, there are methods that are being tried right now to see those by using uh, radio astronomy and uh, looking at uh, effects that occur later on in the universe as driven by the earliest gravitational waves. I hope those but there may yet be need do this very directly, look at the gravitational waves directly that come from that earliest effort. That would be one of the most fascinating things man could do, because it'll tell you very much how the universe started. The fascinating idea in gravitational waves, since they're so <clears throat> imperturbable, they go through everything. They will tell you most information that you get about the earliest instances that go on in the universe. At least I hope so. You know, I, I, I think it's an opening field, it's a wonderful field, and I hope it's with man until we really get everything to the point where the activities are such that we can do cosmological, cosmological investigation due to gravitational. Okay. We're running a bit short of time. I think there's time for one short question, one short answer, please. Yes. 
Good morning, Professor Weiss. My name is Erika Neckham. I'm working at the Swedish National News Agency, TT. Uh, congratulations at first. Uh, Thank I would you. Like, I would like to know uh, what you felt like when you heard the gravitational wave for the first time. Well, what, when, we first, when we first discovered them, yeah, uh, back, in, 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 back in September of 19, uh, 2015, rather, many of us didn't believe it, I have to tell you that. We have a program where we inject signals to test the detector. That's what we thought I was seeing. It took us a long time, almost something like two months, to really convince ourselves that we had seen a thing that came from the outside and was truly a gravitational wave. It, uh, it was not trivial to convince oneself that one had seen those. And then, as time has now gone on, we've seen more of these events, similar kinds of events from black holes, mm -hmm. and it makes it more and more likely, and I'm now very much convinced, I don't think there's anybody left, doubts that uh, detected these gravitational waves. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Weiss, for being with us at this press conference. And we're looking forward to... Uh, Welcoming you to Stockholm in December. Thank you yeah, very much. I look forward bye -bye. to it too. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. And now, are there any questions for the panel? Or Dr. Botner and Dr. Weiss explained it all to you. Okay. In that case, if there are no further questions, we'll close this session. And I know that. Several of you have requested individual interviews that will commence. So thank you very much.